ดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับสบายดีครับทุกคนสวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับทุกท่านโอเค so um I think I will do my live in English language today because uh, I haven't done an English video in a while, and uh, I guess this is like a, a chance for you guys to practice your English too. You can you can write you can write a comment in English below, and I'll try to answer them. And um, yeah, it's nice nice to have a change of pace. Sometimes yeah, I do a lot of. Uh, Thai videos, and then sometimes we do some English videos, and um, and yeah, yeah. So so it's a change of pace. And as I said, I haven't done an English video in a while. And uh, my last English video was a met to the video about the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, and um, and that's in the met to the. And I'll put a link below when I put this video on my YouTube. And um, as I said, that that video, um, I talked about the the motor branch, the motor branch of the trigeminal nerve, or we call it the mandibular nerve, the motor branch of the mandib mandibular nerve. So V three, and that controls the muscle mastication. You know when you chew something, and basically the first uh the first pharyngeal arch the muscle of the first pharyngeal arch so the the muscle of mastication when we chew something grinding food and things like that that's the tri the the, the motor part of the trigeminal nerve so uh as i said uh, i'm gonna do the live in uh english today and you can comment below in english club and i will reply to you in english So today is like uh, for you, a chance for you, for you guys to practice your English too. It's a change of pace, change of pace. สวัสดีครับสวัสดีครับทุกท่านวันนี้ฝึกภาษาอังกฤษกันไหมครับในถ้าถ้าท่านคอมเมนต์คอมเมนต์เป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะผมจะตอบเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับ Alex Lee, glad to see you again. Glad to see you too, Alex Lee. And thanks for commenting in English. So look, today we'll, we'll we'll do the video in English. You know, just just to practice your English and the change of pace. And um, yeah, so it must be like uh, lunch time in Thailand now, right? And it's about like nine nine p.m. Uh, Pacific time on on the west coast of America. So uh, so yeah, just um. I hope you you guys e n j o y your lunch, and um, and as always today, um, I think we will do some some uh some questions, some practice questions today, and um, and as I said, you know, I get these questions from from Kaplan, and uh, and I I said many times that we want to have our own question bank, our own Q bank. And um, this is what 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 we're we're working on. A c m s we want to have our own Q bank for us soon to practice, because as I said, you know, when when you have a Q bank, when you do the question, that's how that's how you apply your knowledge that you've learned in the classroom. So to to apply the knowledge that you've learned in the classroom. Good morning from Denmark. Hello, s o r r y Cup. Good morning. Uh, And good morning from Australia. Oh, Australia must be beautiful now. Uh, it's Southern Hemisphere, so it must be cold in Australia, right? Right now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that many, you know, uh, many of you are commenting and uh, saying hi. So I was saying about the Q Bank. Um, when you practice, uh, you know, when you you practice. It solidifies solidifies your knowledge and solidifies the way that you practice your knowledge. And uh, as I said, that um, that we're working on our Q bank, 
and a Cubang will be more of a study tool. You know, you can you can use a Cubang from day one of your medical school all the way to residency, and um, and I want it to be a study tool. I want to, I want a Cubang to to make sure that you you have strong knowledge base. You know. And, uh, and so everything in a Cuban will be, will be try to solid, solidify your, your core knowledge, your, 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 your basic knowledge, uh, your basic, uh, core principles and stuff like that. I'll give you an example of a core principle or core knowledge, you know? Um, let's say, uh, thyroid questions, right? You need to know your lab value to be able to answer something about thyroid questions. And, um, what they like to test about, like in every um, exam, uh, you have to know your your two values, right? You have to know your TSH, which is the thyroid stimulating hormone, and also your thyroxine, your T4, you know? And let's say uh, the basic lab value for hypothyroidism, primary hyperthyroidism, is that your THA will be very low, your thyroid stimulating hormone will be very low, but your thyroxine and your free free thyroid hormone, your T4 will be very high. That's primary uh hypothyroidism. And primary hypothyroidism, uh what would you see? You will see your T4, your thyroxine, that that's gonna be very low. And your thyroid stimulating hormone, your TSA should be very high. So this is like the basic uh, knowledge that you should know about thyroid. And, and if you have that down pat, if you have that core knowledge down pat, you can answer every thyroid problem that they have on your board exam. And even if they throw you a curveball, even if they try to trick you, if you know those lab values, you can get every problem right on your lab, on, on your board exam. And let me say this before we move on. Um, you know, when I say primary hypothyroidism, what is, what does primary mean? Primary means that the problem's coming from the thyroid gland. That's primary hypothyroidism. So when I say primary hypoth- hypothyroidism, I mean that your thyroid gland is, is putting out so much thyroid hormone. And that's coming from the gland. That's the problem with your gland. So that's primary hypothyroidism. So your thyroid high, hormone will be high naturally. Your, 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 your thyroid hormone, thyroxine, or T4 will be sky high. But your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone will be very low. Why? Well, thyroid stimulating hormone is coming from your pituitary. Your entry pituitary gland sends out your thyroid stimulating hormone. And that's, that that's going to go into your blood and it's going to go to your thyroid gland and the job of TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone is to do what 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 it's called you know thyroid stimulating hormone it's to stimulate your hormone gland to put out thyroid hormone so so in primary hyperthyroidism the thyroid gland is putting out so much uh, hormone already so your TSH don't need to stimulate the thyroid gland. Your TSH should be very low, right? And the opposite, hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism. That means that that your your thyroid gland is not putting out enough uh, thyroid hormone because of of you have you have something wrong with your gland. So your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone, will sense that the blood have very low thyroid hormone. So it's going to want to stimulate your thyroid gland to put out thyroid hormone. So you, what will you see in the lab? You will see that TSH, thyroid stimulated hormone, will be sky high, will be so high, right? Because it's trying to stimulate your, your thyroid to like put out the, the thyroid hormone. So that's going to be very high. And the thyroid, thyroxine, thyroid hormone will be so low. So primary hypothyroidism, low TSH, high T4, high thyroxine, primary hypothyroidism, TSH should be very high, and your T4, your thyroxine will be very low. And this is the basic uh, concept that you need to know to be able to answer 
third question in your board exam and as and and as I as I said my um my Q band that I'm working on is gonna solidify your core knowledge. You know, it's gonna make sure the students have very strong core knowledge so that you know when they go into the board exam, when they see other other test questions, they can like handle all the curveballs. They can handle all the trick questions because like I really believe if you have your core value down, you know, even if you if you even if you face with a trick question, um you know, you 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 gonna you you gonna be able to answer the right question if you know the if you know your core concepts, and you know I'm saying that that other Q banks like U World or Kaplan, those are premier Q bank, those are very good, those are very good Q bank. But sometimes, um, I think those Q banks are very good. You know, when you when when you have all the knowledge and when you're like taking you know six months out from your board exam, uh, you should get you should definitely get U World and work on those. Uh, question because you know uh, keyword is very close to the real exam but if you if you don't have enough knowledge if you're like first year medical student or whatever if you get the U word you you can be tricked out by those questions those questions are very tricky and that you know you, you I don't want like you know your moral to go down to feel bad or something like that or you know the or you know Q bank. Uh, you were on Captain, they're, they're pretty expensive. So, you know, if you're starting a medical school, if you don't have enough knowledge and you get Q when you start doing it, you, you get tricked out and you will not understand, uh, you, you won't understand, um, um, the concept they explain to you because you don't have the knowledge. So my Q and I'm working on, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, um, um, the goal of my equipment is going to be to build up your core knowledge, you know, have a strong base so that when you're ready for your board exam, you, you can get your Q world, uh, you can get your U world and then work on those trick questions and everything like that. So everything starts with the basic knowledge and to have a strong foundation of your knowledge. That's what my Q bank, uh, uh, will be like. So today, let's do some questions together in English. And I see a couple of you, uh, of you um um uh typing in English which is good. Well Alex Lee said that he hates trick questions. Yeah, I hate trick questions too, but as I said, if you have strong core knowledge, if you have strong like knowledge, no question can trick you. You have that basic skill down. So uh so that's a good thing. Alright, so let today let's work let's work on a few questions together. And um, I wrote this question out on a piece of paper, but when I put this video on my YouTube, I'm going to put in the graphic and I'm going to put in the questions um, on that so you can clearly see the question. And, and as I said, I, I, I got these questions from, uh, from, um, from Kaplan, Kaplan Hubank. And the first question, here we go. I'm going to read it slowly. Uh, the first question is, 33-year-old woman presents to the emergency department complaining of right facial weakness and pain behind her right ear since that morning. Neurological examination confirms complete paralysis of the right side of her face, decreased taste sensation on the right side of her tongue, and increase sensitivity to loud sound in her right ear. Um, the rest of neurological examination is normal. The patient is given short course of steroid and her facial weakness improved gradually over the next few weeks. In addition to symptoms described, which of the following might the patient also develop? So basically this question um, describe a 33-year-old woman with, with right side facial paralysis and also she can't taste anything on the right side of her tongue also. And uh, she was given a short course of steroid, maybe cortical steroid, and her, her symptoms of, of facial paralysis improves over a few weeks time. So, and, and the question is asking, um, the question is asking, what are the symptoms might we see in this patient? So let me show you. 
and and of course I'm going to do some highlighting because uh hi bro hey bro what's up <laughs> how's it going um and I'm going to do some highlighting because you know in these questions uh in your board exam you can highlight when you go through the computer and highlighting helps because uh you know when you get lost in the question stem and you read over what you highlight that's going to like take your mind back on track you know to to thinking about the differential diagnosis and think uh of a path to a correct answer so when i highlight i usually highlight what the question you know what what they want to know like in this question they ask which of the following might the patient also develop so it asks like what it asks the symptoms you know the symptoms what what are the symptoms could we see with this facial paralysis and uh what i like to highlight is i i would highlight um the age of the woman 33 year old woman and i highlight the sex of of the patient she's a woman and um and all the symptoms that the, that, that the patient have in the question stem so so right facial weakness and also um pain behind her ear and also she has um paralysis of the right side of her face and decrease in taste decrease in her taste right and um and everything else is normal no logical exam exam is normal and she's given corticosteroids so that's that's uh so that's um that's important and also she has very hypersensitivity in 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 her hearing right so that's that's an important clue uh on the on the um on the question stem so uh so i have i've highlighted i've highlighted um what they asked for they asked for like you know what what other symptoms this patient might have I've highlighted the woman's uh, age. I've highlighted, you know, herself. She's a woman and she's 33 years old. I've highlighted all her complaints, which is, you know, right side facial weakness, right side paralysis, uh, hypersensitivity in her right ear, um, and, and the loss of taste on the right side of her tongue. And I've highlighted the fact that she's on corticosteroid and how corticosteroid is improving her symptoms. So with all of this information, can you make a guess of what this one woman, woman might be having? Like what, what is the problem? You know, what, uh, what is going on with her? Can you make a guess? Is somebody guessing? So with this information, uh, when I read this information, I think that she has, uh, um, something that we call Bell's palsy, right? You, you guys heard of Bell's palsy, right? It's like right, right facial paralysis, temporary paralysis, it's not permanent. And usually another clue is that, you know, uh, usually they give corticosteroid to decrease the inflammation, decrease the inflammation of, of, of the patient's facial nerve. And also, um, and also facial weakness, uh, right ear, um, hypersensitivity to noise, the taste, you know, loss of taste on the right side, everything, everything, all that, you know, is, is, is a branch of your facial nerve. And it happened on one side, it happened on the same side, the right side, it happens on the ipsilateral side, you know, so that's, that's a big clue about Bell's policy. And, uh, Bell's palsy, Bell's palsy is like a paralysis of, of, of your face, but not permanent. Just like, you know, uh, uh, temporary per, per paralysis of, of one side of your face. And nobody knows the exact cause of Bell's palsy, but, um, but, um, but, but we think because, you know, the facial nerve, but we think because of the facial nerve excess, a very little hole from the scalp to your face and that form and that the facial of exit is called stylo um stylomyeloid foramen and that foramen is very narrow 
and when the facial nerves goes, uh, so when so it squeezes on the facial nerve very. Um, uh, if the if the facial nerve have any inflammation, it it squeezes on the inf uh, it squeezes on the the facial nerve. Um, you know right away, and usually what can cause facial nerve um, um, inflammation is like you know um, especially with bell bell palsy, some kind of like uh, a virus. You know, patient will maybe in the question stem they'll they'll say that. That uh, uh, the patient has some some kind of viral uh, some kind of viral uh, virus uh, attack that that they caught last week, and then after that they have facial paralysis. And as I said, it's, it's inflammation of facial nerve, and and the um, and the form when the, the facial nerve exit is so small. So when the facial nerve gets inflamed, it gets compressed. And uh, when the facial nerve gets compressed, um, you know you you have facial paralysis, and you have uh, everything on 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 everything on on the on the uh, everything on the facial nerve that's uh, that's a branch will, will have an effect like uh, like the taste, um, um, the muscle in your middle ear that kind of dims the sound down, the stupidest muscle. This is innervated by a branch of facial nerve, so that's that's gonna cause that. That's why this patient right here is like hearing loud noises, right? And um, and the question it asks you like, what are the symptoms would the patient have? And the choices are a so a decreased sensation over her left cheek, b decreased sensation over her right cheek. Uh, C is deviation of uh, the uvula and soft palate to the left side when the patient say ah. D is deviation of the uvula and the soft palate of the patient to the right side when the patient say ah, right? And E is dryness in her left eye and F is dryness in her right eye, right? So. Um, most of you can guess, I think, you know, if, if, uh, with some basic medical knowledge that the answer would be, uh, that the answer would be F, right? Dryness in the eye, right? Because, you know, that's a branch, that's a branch of facial nerve that goes to lacrimal gland, right? So if, if the facial nerves compress, like all the branches will have, will have some problem. So, if a branch of the facial nerve that's going to a lacrimal gland is compressed, uh, so the eye, the patient's eye will be very dry. The patient's eyes will be very dry, and also uh, with the facial nerve, you know, the, the, the patient cannot blink also. So uh, with patient with Bell's palsy, um, it is recommended that they use eye drop and maybe a patch, and then also, you know, this patient right here, she's on corticosteroid anyway, you know, the corticosteroid will help with the inflammation, right? And the other choice is why they're wrong. Um, choice A, sensation over her, over her left cheek. Sensation of the face is not facial nerve, right? Sensation of the face is what? Trigeminal nerve. Cranial nerve 5 control the sensation of the face. And and facial nerve, cranial nerve seven controls the, the motor function. You know the facial expression. That's that's cranial nerve seven. But the sensation of the face, that's trigeminal nerve. Um, how about deviation of uvula? Uvula and the soft part is, contro is controlled by what? Cranial nerve ten, vagus nerve. So that that has nothing to do with facial nerve. So that's not the answer, right? How about dryness in her left eye? Well, that's that's uh, contralateral side, right? If it's bell palsy, everything's gonna be on the same side because uh, because it affects the facial nerve on one side. So that's that's not the answer. And the answer is like the answer is dryness in her right eye because the patient has uh, has bell palsy on the right, so the, her facial nerve is gonna be uh can have from on that side and all the branch of facial nerve 
like the the branch go to a lacrimal gland, the branch goes to a tongue, uh, will 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 have a will will we'll have some kind of problem. Also, the taste, the taste, uh, is controlled by uh by branch of facial uh, by facial nerve to the anterior two third of the tongue, right? And also that that actually works well with cranial nerve five. Cranial nerve five controls the sensation of the tongue in the anterior two third. Cranial nerve seven controls the taste. So that's that's two things working together. Sensation, sensation of touch, pressure, and stuff like that. That's why cranial nerve five. Sensation of taste. That's why cranial nerve seven. So the answer to this question right here. <coughs> Uh, it's a woman that has bell palsy, and um, and so as I said, um, as I said, the problem with bell palsy is inflammation of facial nerve, right? And when inflammation and 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 when there's inflammation of facial nerve, the facial nerve uh doesn't work properly. So that's so all the branches of facial nerve will have problem like facial movement, lacrimal gland. Um, hearing and, uh, the taste, the taste, the, the taste of the anterior two third of the tongue will, 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 will be affected. And essentially that's what we see in this question stem right here, right? And then you, you just have to apply that knowledge. You just have to apply your knowledge of the facial nerve. And you can, you know, you, you can see other choices, other choices, you know, with the sensation. That's not cranial nerve seven sensation of face cranial nerve five. You, so you can cut that out. That's not the answer. And the deviation of you and soft palate, you have to think that's cranial nerve ten. That's the vagus nerve. That's not that's not uh, that's not um, that's not cranial nerve seven. And then another one. It just says you know dry eye on the left side, and then you have to think that you know. If it's bell palsy, it's gonna be if so lateral side. It's gonna be on the same side. If it's on if it's on the other side, if, if it's uh if it's on the, the contralateral side, that can be bell palsy. So you you can cut that out, and then you will arrive to the to the correct answer. So that's uh so that's one one question that we just did today, and uh and as I said, you know these questions, you um. You you can have all the knowledge you, you 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 have, but if you don't apply it correctly, you know you you you're not gonna get the points that you need to pass the exam. And a lot of thing has to do with uh, with uh, test taking skills too. You know, with all the knowledge, you have to apply it correctly. So with the Q bank, it's uh, you know it 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 it. it 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 let you practice how you apply your knowledge. It it let you practice the test taking skill, and also the time management, and also like little skills like highlighting and stuff like that. You know, and this is a very essential skill when you when you go through medical school. All right, <laughs> and so let's do another one. Let's do another question. But before we do another question, um, how is everybody doing? I saw a few. I saw a few of you commented commented in English and practicing your English. So, uh, so um, so you guys ready for the second question? Okay, the second question. Um, <clears throat> Four trade year old man present to the emergency department one and a half hour after the onset of severe substernal chest pain radiating to his left arm. The pain is accompanied by diaphoresis and shortness of breath and his blood pressure is 165 over 94, pulse is 82 and respirate, respiration rate is 18. Which of the following tests is the most important tool in initial evaluation of patients with acute MI. MI is myocardial infarction, right? Um, when when acute MI is suspected, so basically, this test is asking, you know, if a patient, you know, if you think a patient has 
myocardial infarction. If a patient comes to the emergency room with like, you know, chest pain, a shortness of breath, and you know, um, chest pain radiating, radiating down to uh, the left arm, and now you're thinking this patient might have myocardial infarction, what is the first test, initial test, that you would administrate on this patient? So let me highlight first, and then we'll go through the choices, and then we'll come uh, to the right answer together, okay? As I said, I always highlight, um, I always highlight like the thing that they ask, like this question, it asks the initial test. So, so, so then when I look at my highlight, I know that, that they ask, they ask me like what kind of test I'm going to order for this patient. So they ask me the, the initial test. I'm going to highlight the patient's age, 48 year old and the sex of the patient, he's a man, 48 year old man. So come to the emergency department with chest pain, substantial chest pain, radiating to his left arm, radiating to his left arm. And the pain, and the, the pain is accompanied by diaphoresis. So he's, he's sweating a lot. The patient's sweating a lot and shortness of breath. And his stats, blood pressure, 196 over, nine, 196 over 94 pulse, 82, respiration rate, 18. And then it asks, you know, what test I would order for initial test that I, that, uh, for the patient that I think has MI, what test is the first test that I would order. And as I said, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put this, you know, I'm gonna put this video on YouTube and then when I put the video on YouTube, I'm gonna put uh, the questions up there so you guys can see the question correctly. And I'm gonna put the graphic and everything so everything will be easy. But when I highlight this, you know, when I get lost in the questions, then when I'm doing these questions, um, when I read over what I highlight, that's gonna like trick my mind to like come back to the right place and to go, you know, to, to try and like, you know, like think of the, the correct differential diagnosis, you know, like, like your, your brain has to be like, 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 you know, in, in the right train of thoughts. And sometimes when you're doing these questions, you, you can get lost pretty easy. So highlight helps me bring me back to the to 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 the correct train of thought and so the choices about the choices about these tests let's see a is um aspartate amino transferase b is uh ck m m b so create uh creatine kinase myocardial bound C is EKG, D is echocardiogram, and E is lactate dehydrogenase. So it's asking, you know, like what's the initial test that I would order if I suspect that this patient has myocardial infarction? And so what, what, what do you guys think the, the correct answer is? And the choices, let me read them again. A is aspartate amino transferase. B is creatine kinase myocardial bound. C is EKG. D is echocardiogram. And E is lactate dehydrogenase. So a patient comes to you and you think that the patient has a uh, myocardial infarction. What would you order first? Anybody? In comment below. Comment below. <coughs> Nobody. Okay, so you know this is a very good example of that. You have to read every word of the question stem because you know all these all these answer here, all the answer here, they are correct. Every every choice is correct. Everything everything A B C D E all the choices will show up at some point. Uh, if you have myocardial infarction, you know, like if you do some lab tests, um, creatine kinase, myocardial bound to show up, uh, lactate dehydrogenase will show up if you have, if you have, uh, myocardial infarction. But the question asks you the initial test, the first test that you're gonna order, 
what would it be? And the answer is, you know, EKG, right? EKG, electrocardiogram, because, you know, electrocardiogram is a gold standard for, uh, for myocardial, myocardial infarction. EKG is the first thing that you order. And, and you know, that, that's, that's, that, uh, with EKG, you can see the difference, you know, um, initially. You don't have to wait for, you don't have to wait for like blood draw to see like some, some kind of lab value. When the patients come in, you can do an EKG right away. And you're going to see that, you know, maybe this patient has acute MI and stuff like that. And normally with EKG, you know, you see, you see the electrical, electrical activity of your cardiac cycle of your heart, right? And all that, all that up and down, up and down, like what, what are they? You know, like that's actually, you know, these waves. I'm going to explain to you real quick. Normal for normal EKG. That's a P wave, right? And then that's a quick QRS complex. So, so P and then QRS and then that's a T, T wave, right? On the first thing when you look at on the EKG, the P wave, what is that? P wave actually your atrium, uh, depolarize, depolarizing. So your atrium, the top part of your heart contracts, right? And you're going to see that as a P wave. And then you're going to have the QRS complex. That's QRS complex like that. Like quick wave like that. QRS complex. That's when your ventricle contracts. That's the bottom half of your heart. That's when that contract. That's the QRS complex. So P, P wave, atrium, atrium contraction, QRS complex. That, that's the ventral contraction. And then you have the T, the T wave, the T wave is a is the repolarization of your ventricle. So your your ventricle, like you know, returns returns to the normal shape after contraction. And one thing that we're missing on the EKG is your atrium uh, repolarization. That actually happens during the QRS complex. So when the ventricle contracts, your atrium will repolarize. But you don't see that on EKG because you know when you when 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 your ventricle contract, that activity is so big. It's a big activity that, that it masks your atrium repolarization. Okay? So normally when you look at the EKG, you see a Q you see a P wave P waves, that's your atrium contracting. And then you have the QRS complex. QRS complex, that's, that's your ventral contracting. And then you have your T wave. And your T wave, as I said, is your, your ventral repolarizing, your, your, your ventral returning to the normal shape. It's dilating. Right. And then what happens? What will you see on your EKG? If the patient has acute MI, if the patient has acute myocardial infarction, you might see, uh, you might see, um, an elevate, elevate ST, an elevate ST, right? Or you might see a, uh, um, a depressed ST, depressed ST. Or you might see a Q wave, right? And these were signified to the doctor when, when the doctor's reading EKG that this, that this person might have acute MI. So if you see like an ST elevation or Q, or Q wave, what does that mean? That means that the patient maybe has, um, myocardial infarction, uh, that is, uh, something we, we call a transmural infarction. Transmural infarction is that, uh, that um, that there's a no necrosis of the whole thickness of the left ventricle, like the whole, the whole muscle of the left ventricle, uh, um, is infected. And necrosis, you know, I want to explain this word. Necrosis means that the heart muscle, the cardiac muscle is dead. And it's dead because there's not enough blood to come and, you know, come and give like nutrients, come and give an oxygen to, to, to the myocardium, to the, to the heart muscle. So 
so the heart muscle dies and the transmural infarct just means like you know the whole thickness of the left of the heart of the left ventricle the whole thickness of the wall um uh, is is infected it's 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 the whole cell is dead because there's not enough blood and you're going to see that as a q wave on the on the ekg or st elevation and that's transmural infarction and i said that's that's the whole thickness of the wall uh that 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 that, that the cell and that the tissue is dead and um Another form of infarction is called um, is called subendocardial infarction, and that basically means that only the inner wall, only inner wall of the heart muscle, only in the wall of the myocardium is 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 dead, is is in is infected, and uh, and um, what are you going to see if 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 it's uh, um, subendocardial infarction? You're going to see uh, ST depression is it's, it's a non ST elevation infarction. So you can see the ST wave like like uh, going down like that, right? Uh, so you're gonna see that, and that basically means that your coronary your coronary artery is like it's not fully clogged. Your coronary artery artery might have like a little bit of atherosclerosis or might might have a little plaque that. The blood goes still coming to the to the inner wall to the wall of your heart, but you know it's not coming enough to the in 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 inner wall of the myocardium. So the inner wall, the myocardium will be infected, and uh, so that's what that's what you're gonna see in your EKG. In your EKG, you might see, as I said, a Q wave, ST elevation or ST depression. And that's going to tell the doctor that this patient has acute myocardial infarction. And as I said, this this answer to this question, EKG is the best answer because EKG does the initial test. But you know, all the answer here is correct. All the answer here is correct because at some point, all these all these markers are going to show up. Like if you do a blood test, uh, let's say. Um, Aspartate amino transferase that's going to show up uh, two days after the patient has myocardial infarction, but it's not specific. That comes up if the patient has myocardial infarction, but it comes up two days later. But also, if the patient has some uh, liver disease or, or skeletal muscle disease, aspartate amino transferase will show up in your blood, blood test too. So, it's not specific for, for myocardial infarction. And uh, CK, CKMB, um, create, uh, creatine kinase myocardial uh, bound, that shows up about six hours. You know, that shows up about six hours in the blood after the patient has MI. But, but you know, that's six hours wasted, you know, like, like EKG, the patient, when the patient comes to the hospital, they can do an EKG right away to know the status of the patient instead of like, you know, waiting six hours for like all these markers to show up in the patient's blood. So EKG is the best answer. And the next choice, echocardiogram, you're going to do that too. Patient, the doctors can do do an echocardiogram too, but it's not like you don't need to do it right away, right? You need to do an EKG first, but echocardiogram, uh, you use it to see the structure of the heart. So after the patient has myocardial infarction, you know you can do an EKG to assess the damage to see, you know, which uh, is it does the patient have MI in the inner wall, uh, which which structure. Does the patient have MI? Like, how how is it going to affect um, the patient's uh, cardiac cycle? What kind of like what kind of medication does the patient need, like beta blocker or something like that, uh, to slow down the contractility of the heart? So so EK so echocardiogram, you you need to like you know, assess that with the patient, but later on, not not initial, not initial test, right? And then. Lactate dehydrogenase. This used to be like the 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 standard, the the golden marker of diagnosing uh, myocardial infarction. But but lactate dehydrogenase shows up like 12 hours after the patient has MI, 
and this question asks us the initial test. And as I said, the initial test is you need to do an EKG, you know, an EKG, see, see the cardiac cycle, and when you do an EKG on the patient, you, and if the patient has acute MI, you're either going to see ST elevation, acute wave, or ST depression. But all this answer is correct. You can do, you can, you can do all this to a patient, you know, at some point, but the initial test would be the EKG. So this is an example of like reading the question carefully, right? And the question asks you what initial test? What's the first test that you're going to administrate on the patient? That's going to be the key EKG, right? And yeah, I think that's all I have today, but uh, yeah, it's really nice talking to everybody again. And, and, um, as I said today, I want to do the, the live in English. And, um, I think many of you want to practice your English too. So as I said from the beginning, you can like comment English below and I'll ask you back in English. Um, and yeah, this, this week has been a very tough week and, you know, um, I hope you guys are having a good week, you know, just, just today has been, been very tiring day. Yeah, I had a meeting early in the morning and, um, yeah, just been a tough day in general. And, uh, yeah, it's good. I went to the gym. So I went to the gym after, after I had dinner and, um, yeah, just try to relax and, uh, maybe watch some Netflix later on, but. Um, but again, you know, I'm so happy to come and talk to everybody. And as I said, you know, I'm looking forward to, to talking more about the Q bank that I'm developing. And I'm, I'm hoping it will help a lot of students, you know, especially for students to solidify their core knowledge, you know. So if they have good core knowledge, you know, they, they, even if they've, even, even if they face a tough question on the exam, they're always going to get it correct because, you know, you have strong core knowledge, you know, uh, you can answer any trick question or anything like that. But, um, I think that's all I have for the day. And I hope you guys are having a good day and, and, and a good lunch in Thailand. And, uh, I'll see, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you for tuning in again. So,